Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 17th annual Jeffrey Bava Memorial Lecture. This, in the 100th year of his birth, and originally designed as one of the concluding events of the Jeffrey Bava centenary year, uh, we have come to a particular position in the world where we can't have the usual lecture with the large crowd of people who usually gathers here. Celebrating Jeffrey Bauer has been one of the uh, themes of the Jeffrey Bauer 100 year and we've had a whole series of events until of course the current pandemic struck us and we had to cut short many of them. The Jeffrey Bauer Trust has done this event as I said for the past 17 years and we have had a whole group of uh, wonderful architects presenting their work uh, at this event. Um, to also, I, it is my duty to thank at this point uh, several people. Number one, uh, the uh, long-standing relationship that we have had with Mr. Miles Young, who has often uh, allowed us to bring architects from right across the world uh, for this annual uh, event. And we also want to thank MTV for generously uh, allowing uh, the first broadcast of a Jeffrey Barber lecture uh, in, uh, in, in its history. And uh, we look forward to see the kind of uh, response we get uh, to this lecture uh, from you, the audience. And I also wish to thank Marina Tabusam, architect from Bangladesh, who has very generously at this difficult time agreed to make this presentation online. And for her, it's a sort of first time, she says, and uh, we do look forward to listening to her. Now I hand you on to Shari De Silva, the Curator of Collections of the Jeffrey Bauer Trust, to make a formal introduction to Marina. Shari. Thank you, Channa, and good evening, everybody. As Channa mentioned, my name is Shari. I'm the Curator of Art and Archival Collections at the Lunuganga Trust. It's a great honour to introduce this evening's speaker, an architect whose work, or as she calls it, her pursuit of architecture, has been supremely sensitive to the role of architecture in shaping people's lives and in shaping communities. Marina Tabasum was born in Bangladesh and studied architecture at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in Dhaka. Upon graduating, she formed the practice Urbana together with Kashif Chaudhuri. In 1997, the firm won the competition for work on Dhaka's Museum of Independence, which displays the struggle of the people of Bangladesh from the Mughal conquest to the 1971's final succession from Pakistan. In 2005, Marina established her own practice, Marina Tabasum Architects, and she serves as its principal architect. In 2012, MTA completed Baitur Roof Mosque, a project I'm sure Marina will tell us more about in her lecture. I had the great fortune of being able to visit this mosque in February, and I have to say it really is one of the most wonderful buildings I've ever been to. The mosque has the remarkable quality of being sculpted by light as much as it is by the bricks that comprise it. It is an immensely evocative and spiritual space. Marina received an Aga Khan Award for Baitur Roof in 2016, and of course Jeffrey Bauer himself won the Aga Khan Chairman's Award in 2001, which is a rather lovely connection. In 2018, Marina was the winner of the fifth Jamil Prize, a UK-based award for international contemporary Islamic art and design, also for Baitur Roof. Marina has taught and lectured widely and is currently academic director of the Bengal Institute for Architecture, Landscapes and Settlements. She has also taught at TU Delft in the Netherlands and University of Texas in the USA and Brack University in Bangladesh. Although Marina is unable to join us in person for this lecture, we do know that she will be here with us in person soon uh, when borders open up once more. But until then, without further delay, I'd like you to welcome Marina to this virtual podium. Irie, for this um, wonderful opportunity, and I feel immensely honored that um, that I am being invited to give a talk during the centenary celebration of uh, Jeffrey Bauer's uh, birthday. And um, happy birthday, Mr. Bauer! Uh, I would start with that. And um, 
it is uh, quite a trying time for all of us around the world, um, uh, unprecedented, uh, especially in our lifetime. So, um, uh, though as much as I was looking forward to coming to Sri Lanka to give this talk and to meet my wonderful colleagues there, um, we have to, at this moment, take this opportunity to just be online and, you know, make good use of uh, the technology we've been sort of grown to become quite accustomed to in the last few months. Um, so um, you'll be hearing a lot of noise around me because I'm sitting in my office here and, um, and it is right next to a street. So you'll be hearing a little bit of Dhaka uh, while I will be doing my presentations. Um, and I think that would probably be uh, part of the whole uh, environment. <laughs> So while as a student, I have grown up um, looking at the works and being inspired by our subcontinental elders. Um, and, and you see four of them here who are uh, remarkably important in the way I, my architecture has been shaped. And um, among them, obviously, Jeffrey Bawa is, um, is one uh, whom I would like to discuss today. And, um, you know, I have, like many architects around the world, have spent long hours captivated by the beautiful images and um, powerful drawings that I've seen in books and publications of Jeffrey Bowers. And, um, and I've been intrigued by that for a long, long time. Um, Sri Lanka is only three and a half hours away by flight, but it was never really an opportunity for me to go there until 2017 when um, my entire office, we went to Sri Lanka um, for a Bauer tour um, to commemorate our um, Aga Khan Award achievement in 2016. So the image that you see next to Bawa is me sitting in Lunuganga in 2017. Uh, trying to understand, trying to get into Baba's headspace and, and understand what he was actually thinking while he was sitting there and, and maybe doing some sketches or drawings, I don't know. So that's me. That's our office uh, in Kandalama. That's the whole team, almost 15 of us, I think. We went there and um, so, yeah. So it was, a, it was an absolutely memorable trip, I must say. And I would love to come back again to Sri Lanka any day. So um, while I was sitting there, so this is what I was writing, because I've always been very intrigued by the idea of timelessness of, of architecture. And for me, Khan has, Louis Khan has been always um, uh, the person to look up to, his architecture. So I would just like to read what I was writing while I was sitting there. The spirit of place dominates and rules here as time stands still. The restraint with which Bawa orchestrated architecture as a means, of means to celebrate landscape is a master at work. For a very long time, my idea of timelessness was shaped by understanding and analyzing Louis Kahn's work. From Bawa, I learned an unpretentious way of attempting it. Walking through Kahn's buildings, you, can const you are constantly aware of its powerful presence. Bawa makes you forget its existence and sets you free. Khan's monumentality humbles you, whereas Bawa makes you feel at home. One looks up to connect to infinite, the other found infinite in the horizon of the Indian Ocean. So um, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, we are neighbors. Uh, Bangladesh has a land area which is 2.3 times bigger than Sri Lanka. But the interesting part is that Sri Lanka, uh, in terms of geoformation, is a volcanic and sedimentary rock formation. Whereas Bangladesh, at least two thirds of Bangladesh, is progradation of um, the Gange Ganges um, uh, estuary. So that makes a lot of difference. Um, located in the foothills of the Himalayas, uh, this confluence of three rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Meghna is actually where Bangladesh is located. And if you see here without the landmass, you can see uh, the water that's there. Um, we have more than 700 rivers, 
Um, and then there are lakes, water retention ponds and canals. So the entire uh, landscape, or I would say rather waterscape, is actually crisscrossed with a labyrinth of water. So that makes us different from our neighbor Sri Lanka, perhaps. And if you look at the rivers, uh, the way they move, and these are satellite images uh, of 30 decades, and you can see how these uh, water channels have been moving, uh, at times eroding the banks, and on the other side, uh, creating new land within the riverbeds. <clears throat> so basically, um, that's what it is. It's a very fragile um, alluvium where these mighty rivers um, brings in an enormous amount of flow during the summer months, uh, which is also then added with the rain of monsoon and creates this enormous current which actually erodes the banks. But at the same time, during the dry season when the rain stops and there is much less water coming from the Himalayas, that's when new sediments come up because it's a tidally dominating delta. And so um, this was a commissioned research that we did for the Shaj Architecture Triennial. And we were looking at the uh, lower part of Meghna River because Meghna then moved, uh, flushes onto Bay of Bengal. So that's absolutely a point where the sea meets the river. And if you see the red dots, which is a place, a small town called Haimchor, and we were uh, looking into Haimchor, um, uh, and you can see with the date and the red dot how the land has slowly been engulfed by the river. And then um, at some point, it was completely gone, like let's say in 2000 or 2008, you see that it's completely in the water. And then in 2016, new land is again emerging. So it's a very interesting dynamic phenomena, uh, which has a certain way of, uh, of, of affecting people and the, and the locals who live there. And we were actually trying to understand how this works. And um, the Sharjah Architecture Triennial uh, had the theme around uh, rights of future generation. So we were also looking into that aspect of uh, what happens with uh, inheritance in that sense. So if you see here, side by side, uh, on one side you see the erosion and how everything is being engulfed. Um, and this happens quite often during the uh, monsoon season due to the high current. And on the other side, you see uh, the new land that has emerged. So these are sand beds in the middle of the water. Um, and we visited this in, uh, last year in February, this new found land that was coming up um, in the bed of uh, the Meghna. So this is what it looks like when the new, new land comes up in the landscape. And obviously you can imagine that this brings in a lot of uh, torment and uh, difficulty for people who becomes landless. Many of those who can afford then buy new land in, the, uh, in much more in the inner part of the town and start to rebuild their lives. Uh, but it is quite a torment for the entire population in that area. Now, just to give you a little understanding of why this happens, um, so if you see the left side here, you see that these are the major rivers. This is Ganges. And this was the original flow of Brahmaputra, which um, uh, according to Reynolds map uh, from 1776 uh, during the British time. And then in 1950, there was this devastating earthquake uh, known as the Assam earthquake. And during that time, Brahmaputra changed its course from here to something like this here. And then it brought in an enormous flow of water, which actually added to this whole idea of erosion. And if you see, this is the lower part of Bangladesh. This is the part here. And you see this area, the pink area here, these are um, obviously part of progradation of the Ganges estuary, but um, these have been much more um, 
settled. So these are mature deltas. But the blue ones here are the active ones where these dynamism keeps on occurring. And the other thing is important to note that this is a tide dominated delta. And as such, what happens is during the tide, the water back flows into the systems and then brings again another flow of um, sediments, which then allows these uh, sand beds to be created within the um, river bed. So, um, so that's how the new land emerges. And um, I find this quite uh, fascinating in the sense that Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakuna probably explained it the best that uh, you cannot call this land, this is actually wetness. And wetness is everywhere, according to them. It's everywhere around, uh, around us. But when we try to separate land from water, that's when the problem starts. And that is, a, is an enormous problem, especially in our case, uh, being a delta. And as you can see, it's such a dynamic landscape. So drawing a line is the worst thing you can do in a wetness. But that's what was done during the British time uh, under the Bengal Tenancy Act. These are the drawings that you see here. These are actually uh, CS maps or cadastral survey maps done during the British colonial period um, where they tried to map these sand beds and the uh, edges uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to generate revenue for the, um, uh, for the uh, company, East India Company. And so that was for the first time that these land, which are actually dynamic, uh, were traced and, and given a certain kind of a registration. And that became uh, land uh, official document. And so if you take this land here, and you place it on the current Google map, this is what you see, that most of the land is actually gone, but the paper and the document still remains, which is actually a difficult um, part of the whole situation. That's what we're talking about, that you draw a line where you should not be drawing because it is entirely something of a wetness. And not only just um, drawing lines, but they are also documented as land deeds, so the land deed that you see here is the auction deed, which then the British uh, colonial rule passed it as an auction uh, to the locals uh, to, uh, to generate income. And then when the British colonial left, uh, this, they, sorry, this was actually the lease document. So this was leased to the locals. This is the auction document where when the British left, they auctioned it to the local people. So then they became the owners. And then from Pakistan period onwards, till Bangladesh, this land uh, or these deeds of agreements have been passed on from one generation to the next generation um, in terms of uh, ownership or inheritance. So if you look here, I think this is quite an interesting thing because this is Haimchor. And uh, at one point it used to be land, but now it is completely divided in between by the Meghna River. And you see that this is the new chore, which uh, you saw we were walking on. And if you see, that's the, the uh, we, we actually traced one single plot, which is 1867, plot number 1867, which is actually located right here. And that plot 1867 is being, uh, in, in terms of paper, is actually being, um, handed down from one generation to the next generation. And you see here, these are the two people now holding on to the papers, but the land has moved. moved. It has moved from, from different times till now, and at one point it has gone into water. And when the land is taken by the water, basically people just wait with their papers for it to come back. And at times it comes back in one generation, at times it comes back in three, it never comes back at times. So um, it is a kind of a hope people hold on to. And this wasn't the case before these lands were actually documented and, and drawn in lines. So in a way it was a, um, an idea of a dry culture that was imposed on a wet culture uh, by the British. And we have seen the impact of that till date. And if you see here, 
these are actually map. We try to map the different households and the and the um, the bazaars that were there in Hangzhou, and to see actually trace how they have moved from one location to another location. And you have, and there are numerous stories of families who has moved from, uh, from moved in their lifetime three to four times for, because of this river movement. And what we found quite interesting, because along this entire belt or the banks of the river, starting from uh, Brahmaputra coming down uh, to Podda uh, and then to Meghna, you see this interesting house form, which is a vernacular house form, which is actually a flat pack system. You, um, uh, you take these houses and when the, the moment they see a crack in the ground and they'll know that uh, this will be, that erosion will be coming very soon, they immediately take these houses down. Uh, it takes about two hours to take these houses down and then put them on a boat or a, or a truck or anything and then move them to a safer location. And then re-erecting it takes about uh, two weeks uh, maximum. So this has been the house form that was generated to be able to uh, cope with this situation. So these are the mobile houses that you see in these areas as vernacular. So um, uh, you see that there are markets um, uh, along the riverbanks where you can actually go and buy these houses and, or, or order it according to your own need. And so for the Sharjah Triennial, we actually bought three of these houses and took them to Sharjah. The idea was that if it can, it's a mobile home. So basically you can actually move them from one location to other. Uh, so if it can move from one part to another, it can move from one city to another city. So that was the idea to take it uh, with us. So, um, so this is actually the house form that you see along that, um, along that belt. So now the uh, call for prayer has started. Should we uh, continue or should we um, stop for a while? Do you hear it? It's not overpowering your voice. No, it doesn't overpower your voice. Okay, fine, perfect. So these are the house forms that uh, we um, have uh, along the uh, Brahmaputra, Meghna, and Podda uh, banks. And in Sharjah Architecture Triennial, basically uh, it was, um, the venue is an abandoned school and we were given a courtyard to place our project. So the three houses that we bought and shipped to Sharjah in a kind of a flat pack manner. And we actually, uh, three of the architects from our office and uh, one carpenter went there and it took them about 15 days to erect the entire thing. Um, and this is the houses. And here you see in the left um, in its own how the houses are built and it is in Sharjah on the right. Um, and inside the houses, we had the uh, different um, research that we took um, there, the entire research that we did. It was actually presented, um, printed on pieces of cloth and hanged there. So, and this is in the context of Sharjah. You can see the city uh, and uh, the buildings that we had. And I find especially these ornaments quite beautiful because even though this entire uh, house form, uh, vernacular house form, actually generates uh, from an idea of movement. At the same time, it is not without the aspiration of, of, uh, of these beautiful ornaments. So that's also quite fascinating to see. So now uh, this is the south, side, south part of Bangladesh, which is Shundarbans, as you can see, a satellite image, which is almost like a painting. And this is uh, more the matured delta. Um, and here, um, this yellow dot here, it shows the uh, Panigram Resort site, which is a resort project we were commissioned to do in uh, 2006. And this is uh, within that matured part of the delta. And if you look at it from uh, a Google image, you'll see that this is a very fertile ground because this is all alluvium. And the entire um, agricultural scene or the maximum vegetables and fruits and everything is grown in this part of the area uh, because of this uh, fertileness of the ground. 
and um, the entire Bangladesh is fed by this. So uh, the site of ours is actually right here. So there is a river, this is Kopotakko, and there's another river which is a very uh, narrow, uh, known as the uh, Bhoirog. So basically two rivers on two sides and we have this site in the middle. And that's the view from the river towards the site. And as you can see, it's a very agrarian uh, landscape, very green. I think to some extent it also resonates a lot of, part, lot, lot of the parts of Sri Lanka as well, I guess. Um, you wouldn't be able to tell if it's Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. So that's quite nice, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you see uh, that life is very, um, very slow paced in a way. Uh, you still see cow carts and people are moving in a very different manner. And um, yeah, I find this quite compelling in the sense that uh, when you go, especially a formally trained architect to a site like this and you're asked to design something, do you really have the knowledge to draw a line in that uh, landscape? So that was becoming quite of a dilemma for me uh, while working on this project. So while I was visiting the site, this is what my understanding was. My thing is I quite often write rather than sketch. So, um, so wherever I go, especially on a site visit, um, I try to write my, my uh, feelings or my understandings and dilemmas. So this is one such that rural Bangladesh is uniquely beautiful. And uh, the project gives an opportunity to bring back the lost pride and belief in the wisdom of the land crafted over hundreds of years of dwelling in the Delta. And it just didn't feel like that, um, that this, this pristine quietness and this silence should be, uh, you know, wrecked by the noise of architecture. So that became one of our main motto in this project. So we try to understand how the Delta actually works. And Delta is basically a flatland, as you can see. So the, the basic idea of creating architecture in the Delta is about digging a pond. So generally people dig a pond and you see here uh, that you dig a pond, you take the earth out and then you create a mound and on the mound you actually place your buildings. And this is, if you see here, it's all dotted with ponds small ponds where again the water when it rains the water goes into that pond so it's a collection point as well so uh, so this is uh, predominantly the way uh, people in the delta has been uh, carving out their own space um, of living and so we basically did an entire research on the uh, area surrounding our uh, site to understand how people live, how people have been um, building uh, their own houses. And so it's a predominantly mud buildings, as you can see, because there's no other material. And we tried to uh, find the program of the house. And so basically one household would have all these different elements as a program of a, of a village homestead. And these small elements are actually then um, placed around a courtyard, which is not a distinctly defined courtyard because the courts are linked with one another in a very communal atmosphere. So one house, from one house, you can move to the next house and to the next house. So it's a very, um, very congenial communal living. And, um, and, and, and these courtyards are very beautiful spaces actually where the entire uh, life is lived outdoors and not indoors. And so if you take these courts and you connect them, this is how the village comes out. So this is a, one of the villages that we documented. And um, you see, uh, this is actually a potter's village. So the potter's village has a certain formation because they do pottery. And so they need a larger square courtyard where they can dry their pots. So they have a certain formation and in a way a living of a potter's. <laughs> There was a noise. Should I? Start? Yeah, just again, yes. Okay. So this is actually, you see how the potters actually live. So that's, this is one of the potters' house, Nimai Pal. Um, and this is a, a bamboo weaver's village. And the bamboo weavers, since they work with bamboos and they need linear space, the courtyards generally turn into much more linear in form. So the entire village formation changes 
when the skill changes. So that's also quite interesting to find. So while doing this research and documentation, we kind of became very close to these people who are living surrounding the site. And the other ingredient, which was for me an important one, was uh, this Bangla roof, which is actually uniquely of Bengal. And you've seen that being copied by the Mughals, and we also have those in our temples. So uh, this roof form you don't see anymore because this, is, this has completely now um, not seen in the landscape because of the corrugated iron roof uh, that people generally prefer, corrugated metal sheets. So um, the idea was to kind of revive them if possible through that resort project. So this is the side, as I was mentioning, and you can see the waterways and the way uh, the vehicular axis would be. And so we embarked on our own um, um, design and the master plan of the site. And we decided to create this formation of uh, Bengali homesteads and, and villages to some extent where people could come and get an authentic understanding of how people live. And the other idea uh, was actually um, from the client uh, in a way that they wanted a project which would be a socially responsible project, an environmentally responsible project. So in that sense, we uh, wanted to also incorporate uh, certain things on the site. And so these are some of the bungalows, as you can see, in terms of plan. Uh, the thickness of the wall, as you see, is actually because of the mud. Uh, these are all mud walls, and we decided to go for vernacular construction technique. And so these are some of the locals who live there. This is one of the Potter's villages. And we, um, as a bid to create this socially uh, responsible project, we then uh, gathered most of the villagers surrounding our site to come and actually build the project for us. So here you see this young man, Shumon, uh, who's still working with us. Actually, um, you know, he was, he was educated in the village with the hope that he will be coming to a city, maybe in Dhaka, and get a job. And generally, in the cities, it's a, it's a real struggle. So for us, the idea was that, that how you can actually keep them in their own location. And the other thing is, that his grandfather, as you see here in the middle picture, is, is a potter. But um, he, the, this skill of pottery was not handed down to him because it doesn't make much profit and very difficult a life to live on pottery. So um, he basically uh, went to school and doesn't have the skill anymore. So to some extent, it was also the idea of bringing back the pride, uh, which is about skill. And so we employed him to then have product designers coming and designing uh, so that we can actually take some of these elements from the villages to be able to uh, give them or generate income for them at the same time and can help us uh, with the resort project. So all the people that you see on site are actually from the village. Um, and um, though the entire vernacular system is to and uh, we changed a bit of the way the constructions are. We used sun-dried mud bricks rather than using earth uh, as the villagers do because it's a large project and it, we needed a faster um, construction technique. And so uh, this is how the buildings were created. And this, as I was mentioning about the Bangla roof, so we only found two um, teams actually in the entire of south uh, side of uh, Bengal where they are able to still uh, build this uh, a beautiful structure with the thatch. So we actually uh, brought them in to create this uh, structure. And we also have women uh, working on the site and, and they do the best plaster as you can see. Uh, all the mud works are generally done by women here the ladies are um, resting after their day's work. So this is what you see from the uh, riverside. So that's the elevation of the project. So for us, it was a kind of an idea that um, it was basically designing a process rather than designing buildings. We did the master plan, but then later on, and, and did the planning of the houses, but then later on we left uh, it to the villagers to come and build it. So 
it helps both um, in a way to generate a certain kind of a, a language of architecture, which is actually embedded in that landscape. And at the same time, it uh, helps generate a certain kind of a relationship between the village and the resort. So these are some of the images that you see. Uh, two bungalows together. And the other thing that we did since uh, when you have a project already completed um, and you have already developed this uh, relationship with the locals, uh, it was definitely an important part in the entire project that we um, created this Panigram community initiative where uh, we then, especially from the uh, resort side, we started uh, with all these different kind of activities with the villagers where we did craft diversification workshops. So the idea was when the uh, resort starts to bring in guests, these, uh, they, they can create these small crafts that they can then sell to the, to the guests. And then we also created this savings group where women started saving money to build their own environment to a better, let's say, a better toilet, a better hygiene, better kitchen or even houses for themselves. So we created this savings group where women um, every day, uh, every week saves a dollar. I think this is also something quite unique in Sri Lanka because there, there's also similar kind of women's bank um, there. So in a way we were um, also inspired by that. And, and we have architect Hasibul Kobir and, um, and a community architects organization called Puka. Uh, they actually helped us with this um, savings group project um, and this craft diversification workshops. And here you see women mapping the community. And the maps that I just showed you were actually uh, done by the local girls uh, who goes to school. So basically, they created their own map, and which we then use. Um, this is one of the projects, as I was mentioning, Hasibul Kobi, he did where they map the community and then there is some aspirational models that they themselves make. And then from there, you can see these are the houses that were already built. And, um, and so this is the system. This is a house that was built uh, with the dollar 1500. And so this idea was also my idea for the studio I took um, at Harvard GSD where the project was uh, building a $2,000 home. And the interesting part is that um, it was actually a process of co-creation, uh, a kind of a bottom-up process where the students had to come and visit the site, obviously, and go and see what $1,500 can actually build uh, for the local communities. And this is my studio, as you see, all the students. and. Um, they were also taking part in hands-on workshop at Panigram while the construction was on and, and also coming and talking to the, uh, the villagers. Uh, we selected five uh, clients for the students and they basically went and talked to them in a bid to create a certain kind of a, uh, understanding of what their aspirations are. And you see the model in the middle. So this is built by the local uh, villager uh, to make them understand what kind of a house that is. And here, after the studio was complete, you see we had an exhibition on the, in the village. And so these are the drawings we printed out of the students' work, which was then showed to them. Uh, here again, another client uh, from the um, Bamboo Weavers community and uh, the students engaging in a conversation, in a dialogue and uh, then creating a design. Uh, this is a, an image of the review. And here you see the exhibition on site. And some of the students' works where they tried to employ a local material, local craft uh, to be able to, uh, to make the project uh, come to the right um, budget because the budget was very important, it's $2,000. And in a way, I think it was an important uh, lesson for them because um, they are, uh, you know, for, for them, $2,000 uh, is not even a course fee. So 
the, the, the value of money for uh, a person who is living in a rural uh, village in Bangladesh, uh, for, him, for them, it's a lifetime saving. So basically to, to make them understand that, you know, it's not about the budget, but the innovation that you can create with that small money. So um, this turned into a book, um, $2,000 Home, co-creating the Bengal Delta. Uh, that was published by Harvard GSD. And we also took this idea of uh, creating a courtyard in the Venice Biennale when we were invited to uh, participate um, during 2018, Architecture Biennale. And uh, the idea was free space. And um, one of the uh, writings uh, that I found from the curators was about choreographing the daily life, um, going beyond the visual and choreographing the daily life. And I thought that courtyard, I mean, there's nothing can be more important than a courtyard in a Bengal Delta, which actually is about free space. And so um, we decided to focus on this idea of wisdom, wisdom of the land. That's what our uh, installation was also called. So wisdom of the land, um, obviously at a time uh, when information is so much around uh, data and information, so where is knowledge, where is wisdom, to sort of to look into that. And what we did is, uh, in order to create this courtyard, we decided to go and uh, source different materials that actually create this courtyard. So all the different elements that you see of a household. Um, so the villagers actually uh, donated or gave us um, these different elements, which we took then to Venice. Um, so these are actually granaries, as you see, and this women, uh, women generally make them uh, during the dry season. And uh, one of the granaries you see here in Venice uh, in our installation. Um, so this is again a grinder. I'm sure you have this too in Sri Lanka, perhaps. These are the day beds, um, some of the potteries to give it a look of a potter's village. So this is our plan and that's the site we were given. Uh, in the Arsenale and um, and so this is the courtyard that we created and where you see that the houses are completely uh, disappearing with only lines and what you see is all these different elements of a household that is there so these are some of the images of the um, courtyard that we created So um, moving on, uh, this is an, also in the coastal area, uh, close to Chittagong. And in April 1991, there was this devastating uh, Category 5 hurricane, um, which was passing by on uh, exactly 55 kilometers down uh, of um, Chittagong. And it was quite an... Uh, quite a devastating uh, cyclone where 138,000 people lost their lives. And the site we were given to work on there alone in Bashkali, 40,000 people uh, were killed by this uh, enormous cyclone where the uh, surge was about six, uh, um, six meters high. So we were uh, given this project to design a cyclone shelter uh, which would also work as a health hub and a mosque. So it's a three different kind of uh, program uh, embedded into one. And the site, as you see here, is actually uh, 2.5 kilometer from the Bay of Bengal. So, um, and the, the, there was, at that time, there was no embankment, but now this red line that you see is actually the embankment that was built um, later time. So we decided to have the embankment go around our site because it was in between the sea and the embankment. So it was necessary to, to create that embankment go around. And then um, uh, since it's a three different projects in one, in a way, because it's a mosque at the same time a cyclone shelter, I mean, the mosque can double as a cyclone shelter when it's needed. And the health hub, definitely, because there is no health facilities around that area. Um, so uh, it was also a necessity. So this is a mosque you see um, from the Mughal times, the Midha Mosque, which I find quite, uh, quite an interesting um, form of architecture. 
and, and this is actually showing the lower part of uh, the Mridha Mosque. So it has a base and on top is sitting the mosque. And this is Louis Kahn's um, hospital that he built here in Dhaka. So in a way, I tried to bring all these things together and create something of a, of a project, which is uh, a mosque and a, and a health hub, which is also doubling as a cyclone shelter. So the upper, upper level is actually the mosque area with the court in the middle, and the lower part will work as a health hub. So the lower part will be uh, mostly vibrant with health facilities. This was supposed to be going into construction now, but due to pandemic now, it has been shifted to uh, whenever it's possible to get into construction. So you see, that's the plan. So we have these uh, squarish forms, which are kind of independent. And then we let the air flow in, in terms of, uh, so that it does not create a solid wall against the uh, wind flow, which is quite high during the cyclone times. So we would let the wind go flow through this. But at the same time, these structures actually act on their own. And you see, this is the ground floor plan where you have, we have the um, health hub. And then this is the upper floor plan where we see the mosque, actually. This area is actually the mosque with a courtyard in the middle. And we, we have some facilities on the sides. And uh, as I was mentioning, because uh, it's a cyclone, it needs to double as a cyclone shelter, because it's a cyclone prone area, we actually um, created a very blank facade not to let uh, the wind break away the glass or anything. And these are, are actually the points where the air can flow in through. And that's the embankment which goes around the building. And uh, once you're in, there is all, all these interesting labyrinth-like spaces, uh, which are courtyard and also mosque, which is in the upper level. And in the lower level, you can see the health hub down there. So it's a, it's a very uh, interactive space-wise inside, but from the outside, it's a very closed uh, environment because of the cyclone. And as you see that we use brick a lot because being a delta, that's the only material we have. Um, other than mud. So throughout history, all the uh, impermanent structures, especially built for people, uh, vernaculars were built with mud. And um, especially the permanence, like this one is a Buddhist monastery, and you can see that this was built with brick. So all the permanent structures were always built with brick. And the beautiful intricate um, terracotta that you see so we have really good brick masons and, and it has been a culture uh, for many, many centuries. So I try to stick to the local material because quite often the budgets are very low. So this is one such uh, house that we built outside of Dhaka, um, also taking in uh, the local climate in consideration. Um, so this is a nine square grid plan, which kind of echoes the project I just showed you earlier. Uh, but in a smaller in scale uh, to some extent, which has a central atrium. And the, these are the spaces on the side. There are four courts on the edges. Um, and, and the reason of having this central void is obviously to, uh, to create the stack effect where the airflow can then um, happen. So ventilation is absolute necessity. So courtyards have been there in our culture as it is there in Sri Lanka as well. And you see here, um, uh, that's one of the projects we did much earlier while I was still in Arbana. And this is a courtyard where I grew up as a child. And this is a courtyard which I built later on. So being in the uh, in a, a, a tropic, of, tropic of Cancer passing through Dhaka, Bangladesh, actually, it makes us a subtropical climate. And we have a monsoon season, um, and then we also have a dry season. And so uh, during the monsoon time, uh, which is also the summer, it's very, very hot and humid. So obviously the necessity for uh, airflow is an absolute must. So the first building that you see uh, of a tropical nature in our modern context was Mazar al-Islam's um, Fine Art Institute. 
And that building, in a way, uh, for us, um, created this uh, idea of a tropical modernity to some extent, and this idea of a pavilion structure. So basically, all you need is a roof to cover yourself, and then that's all. That's all architecture really needs because uh, the temperature is quite bearable. And one of our first projects where you see um, this uh, building where we tried to blur the edge by creating these openings which are flexible and trying to make it as um, open and as uh, connected to the nature as possible. And even in a 12-story residential building, this has also been uh, the same idea of how you can bring in air and make the architecture breathe. breathe. So the breathability, the idea of breathability has always been there in our practice. Um, you see the edges have been designed in a way to, to create that idea of ventilation. Uh, this is a building which is a developer project, the only developer project we ever actually did. Um, but the idea was to also see that there are possibilities if you want, you can create something which is, doesn't need to be an air conditioned building, but it can actually work as a uh, naturally ventilated building. Uh, another new project which, is, uh, which we've finished designing and now in the process of approval is a residential building which is in this yellow site here. And there again, we try to create this, uh, take this idea of long verandas, which has also been there, uh, long verandas around the courtyard. And so taking this idea, the element of veranda, which is absolutely not there anymore, especially in our urban context, we try to wrap the veranda around our building uh, in this residential facility where you see this veranda is wrapping around the entire building. So to create a certain kind of a buffer between the lived spaces and these um, natural spaces, which is also kind of uh, creating a connection between nature and uh, people. So that's a, a new project. And you see here, these are the living spaces and we've created these courtyards, which are then working also as a shaft um, to create this ventilation. And, and you see the veranda, uh, wrapping around the entire building project. These are the plans of different uh, floor plans. And so we are in the process of approval for this one. Um, Dhaka, uh, this is Dhaka actually here. You see that's the parliament building uh, surrounded by water on all sides, but the city is a, is a mega city. It's, it's, it's growing at a, at a very high and fast rate. And it has, um, it is one of the fastest growing cities in the world, one of the densest. And Dhaka has the same population as, uh, as Sri Lanka, I think. We have about uh, 20 million people living in the city of Dhaka. So it is quite a challenging uh, place. And as you see, the informal and formal, both are living side by side. Uh, one is not without the other, both need each other, but at the same time, one is invisible to some extent to the government and the other is visible quite much. Uh, and this has been a problem for us for a very long time, but, um, but that's what it is. And so, um, so this is what, uh, some data of Dhaka where you see that it's an area of 300 square kilometer with a population of 18 to 20 million and the density is about 47,000. So um, you see here, it's a, it's a um, uh, very dense situation. The, the greens are, you can see it's only visible, very, very limited green, but a very um, predominantly built environment. So um, here, um, this, you see this blue dot, which is absolutely on the northern edge of the city, is actually uh, where the mosque site is, where uh, we, I was given the opportunity to build this mosque project. So these are the fringes uh, where um, the Dhaka city actually ends to the north. And these are places where um, 
quite often, um, it used to be agrarian in many ways. So from 2004, you can see how this entire area is completely, has changed from being a very uh, low density to a high density residential development. And uh, so this is where the mosque site is. Um, and the, for, for the project, my grandmother was my client. So she had some land and she donated a part of her land to build this mosque because there was no mosque in that location. And here you see her sitting um, uh, during our, uh, during a prayer ceremony when this, uh, it was declared that there will be a mosque and we had a groundbreaking ceremony at that time. So this is a prayer and you can see that it was still a very you know, village-like atmosphere. So with the mosque, uh, again, as most of my projects generally goes through a, a research before I get into design. So I just wanted to find out what is actually a mosque. How did it come into being? So that led me to this I, to these drawings which you see here and here it shows that mosque was actually born out of this um, out of house form in the Arabian Peninsula and from the house form then expanded into uh, a, a, a scale where congregations could take place so this is uh, what uh, the mosques are generated from and as Islam grew from the Arabian Peninsula went to the east and to the west, um, the mosque form actually adapted to the local culture, the local construction technique and local material. So you see many different forms of mosques um, in every different region where you go. Uh, so uh, in a way, that is also something quite interesting because in our own part, especially in Bengal, these are the mosques that you see. Uh, these are the first authentic mosques uh, from the um, from the Sultanate period. And so in a way, for me, that was a con connection. And I thought, you know, this would be an interesting point to start with. And these are the state of mosque that you see now. These are just uh, spaces where there is no quality of prayer. When you go to a mosque, you definitely want to connect with the divine. But um, in this kind of situation, I do not know how that happens. And the symbols are also in a very sorry state, as you see here, uh, a dome and a minaret. And then the question was, do you really need this um, to identify yourself as a Muslim or, or to identify a mosque? Do you really need a dome and a minaret? So these are the questions that were raised by this entire project. And I kind of uh, was always fascinated by spaces which are about light, which are about spirituality. And here you see an image of Hagia Sophia and the mosque in Cordoba. Both to me are inspirational spaces uh, which talks about spirituality. So I tried to um, uh, bring into my project that idea of spirituality rather than going into symbolism. And so this is the site and you see the mosque here. This is one of my first sketches. And uh, the site is actually... Um, um, the, the prayer hall actually needed to be shifted to a certain angle uh, to be in a alignment with the Qibla direction or the direction towards which um, Muslims pray. Uh, but the site was of a certain different direction. So I made that shift. And to facilitate that shift, I, I kind of, you can see through the sketches that there was then a circle introduced to be able to create that shift. And that also helped me in many ways to create the airflow that's necessary. And in many ways, taking inspiration from old architecture to create a certain kind of an architectural uh, understanding. And this is the conceptual plan that we first do. And as I was mentioning that this circular drum volume actually helped me to create that open to sky spaces, which then works as a, um, as a, uh, shaft for ventilation and light. The, the main central structure, which is the um, prayer hall, is actually built in concrete. But the entire, other, the entire project otherwise on the side is a wrapping with uh, brick, uh, load-bearing structure, because uh, the project is a low-budget project. And so we try to minimize cost as much as possible. So that's the plan you see. So you enter from here, from the south side, 
Um, so there's a colonnade and then you do not go straight to the mosque, but you take a few bends before you are allowed to enter into the space. Uh, this is, in a way, for me, an idea that you need to, as you take the turns, you are slowly being, uh, di uh, taking away the diversion of the uh, daily life, and then you're focusing much more on the act of praying. So it was necessary to make these bends to prepare one to go into the act of praying. So these are the different drawings, as you see some of our sketches. And the other thing is you see here that it's a very perforated structure, uh, in a way a breathing wall so that it allows this airflow to, to take place. Uh, as I was mentioning, brick architecture is, uh, is the uh, architecture that we have. Uh, so these are the people who actually comes from the north of Bangladesh and the best of Masons, so we employed them. So this guy here is actually uh, this one, Shorifur. He's um, a winner of the Khan Award because he was responsible for building. As I was mentioning about the breathing wall, um, so it, it is in a way a perforation and these perforations and jalis are also there in our local mosques. So you see this is the mosque in its surrounding. Um, uh, I think after this image was taken, there are so many more new buildings have already popped up. So at one point, I understand that this mosque will not be visible anymore from the sides. So the idea was not to look outside, but to more look within oneself. So, so that's one of the images in its context. So it's a predominantly uh, lower, lower to lower middle income neighborhood and um, uh, growing quite fast in a way, uh, becoming a settlement. And you see here, this is the inside of the prayer hall, whereas the outside temperature or the light is so much more harsh, but you can manipulate that when you work in sections to bring in beautiful light. And so this is one of the one of the open courts, which is looking towards west, uh, which is the direction uh, Muslims pray. And uh, I think um, since this project was a very low budget project, um, light became an element for me to design with. So the, the only ornament in this building is actually light. So I will finish it here. Thank you for your time and listening to me. And again, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And it has been an honor to be presenting. Thank you so much. Marina, we have a few questions. From Vishwadharini, we have a question. You must have visited a lot of buildings, mosques, while constructing Baitu Rauf Mosque. But what was the one building design that truly inspired you? That's a good question. Um, well, uh, I did visit a lot of buildings, um, not just during making the mosque, but also uh, while, you know, through my journey in architecture. So basically, um, one um, uh, aspect was um, go doing this project, which was with the Urban Planning Council of uh, Abu Dhabi. So we worked on a guideline for Urban Planning Council of Abu Dhabi for a mosque regulation. So that gave me an opportunity to look into mosque architecture of the Arabian Peninsula. That really actually helped me in uh, understanding where mosque comes from. So that was really useful. But that one building, I would say two building actually, not one. Um, one is the Hagia Sophia, I was showing the images. And the other one is um, uh, the mosque in Cordoba, the Grand Mosque of Cordoba. These two buildings are, you know, to me, absolute inspiration. Uh, Hagia Sophia is definitely a, a basilica, uh, but the, the quality of light is, uh, is just magical. So, you know, if, if you want to feel that sense of awe, I think that's one building that gives you that. And the mosque in Cordoba has this infinite space and then the light is also quite amazing. So both the buildings have something to do with light and spirituality. And I think uh, these are the two buildings I would say that the most inspirational for this project. From Ranitri, we have, I would like to know more about how you balance the business of architecture alongside the community 
driven participatory design efforts that we often see in your work? Right. Well, so basically these community driven projects are, um, uh, are part of the architecture project, actually. The, let's say the, um, the project that I showed uh, with uh, resort, uh, we convinced the resort owners that, uh, that you cannot create a boundary where it's a gated community and you just let visitors in and you just let them just be inside that space. You need to expand that boundary and also make the vis visitors your boundary in a way so to to some extent that's a kind of a social um, commitment uh, also from the size side of the um, resort so in a way we try to convince the client to be a part of it and so well obviously we are being paid for the project that we are doing on um, uh, as an architect as a consultant the extra that we do is to some extent it's our uh, from our own sense of responsibility that we do it and, and I think it's so important for architects to actually put that extra, um, whether you're being paid or not, because that's a, that's a responsibility as a, as a professional that we owe to our nation, to the people who are not able to do that. And in a way, the way I say that is because, you know, the disparity is getting uh, bigger day by day, the inequity that we see around the world. And so for that reason, if we want to be relevant uh, as a profession, we have to do more than just being bounded within our site and designing beautiful buildings. We need to expand our agency. And that's what I keep on talking about, that expanding your agency means that you have to engage yourself um, and your, uh, you know, whatever you are able to give. Uh, and, and that needs to be absolutely with uh, people. So, so that's important in many ways. So, you know, whatever way you can, even if it's a project in the city, try to employ people who are craftsmen, who can give, uh, you know, add some value to the project and you need to design around it. So basically, uh, you know, from your own project, you can make these avenues where you can actually contribute differently. And to some extent to answer how my business of architecture goes, I try to keep my team small. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's my uh, that's my goal. Actually, we are not more than ten ever, so the maximum it goes is ten. That's my capacity. Um, so when you are a, a productive small team, uh, you produce better. So that's how I see it. So you know, keeping small is probably a, a good tip I can give to young ones. So thank you very much, Marina, for that wonderfully inspiring talk, and for those of you who joined us this evening to celebrate the birth of one of Sri Lanka's most extraordinary sons, Jeffrey Bauer. We thank you all very much as well.